Okay, um, yeah, I'll be talking in English. I try to um, speak as clearly as I can. If you have any problems understanding me, then please just say so. <coughs> um, you wanted me to introduce myself for a moment, which is my favorite topic, really. No, um, but um, yeah, we have an, an extra moral research institution, a research institute which is outside the university, that's the InSycho logo which you can see there, Institute for Science and Innovation Communication. And then I'm also, as you said, a very boring civil servant, just a, a normal professor for science communication, which indeed is still a very seldom phenomenon. We don't really have too many people who are science communication profs in the world. So I feel flattered, I feel honored as well to be doing that. And um, also the responsibility to train the, what we call the next generation of science communicators because as we will see in the next um, probably three quarters of an hour I think um, the field is changing quite dramatically and um, this is quite an exciting moment in time in Russia that you are about to start your first degree program that this field is really also developing here in Russia. Um, the idea would be um, to provide tonight a bit of an international perspective because I presume also what I've seen from Jena yesterday um, was more of a Russian perspective so my job should be for the next hour to um, look beyond um, the Russian borders so to speak. Um, that's why it's called Sense Communication in Europe but I've also got a bit of a global picture there. Okay, um, it usually helps since in, in science we um, tend to, we like to define things and uh, uh, lots of opinions, of course, how many epochs, how many categories you can put science communication in, in terms of historical development. Um, I published a book in 2011 um, which called for, um, open the curtain for the fifth phase, I think would be the title in English probably. Vorhang auf für Phase 5 in German, for those who speak Niemiecki Jusik. Um, and that started with a historical outlook. We always had science communication in the 20th century. We started off with very positivistic utopias. Science fiction is a very good example where um, popular culture painted rather positivistic images of how the future could, could look like, what technology could all do, that it solves the, saves the world, uh, solves our problems. And as you can see, moving forward, um, then governments, institutions started to embrace this idea of enlightening the population, the, 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 the people, society at large. There was the great time of science literacy studies where we found out that people don't know particularly much about science and technology and we're going to have a look at some figures in a minute. <coughs> and so the objective was there's a deficit um, of knowledge so let's try to enlighten um, the population. Then, however, um, there were also disasters. Yeah, there's a Bhopal a chemical disaster in India, there was Three Mile Island disaster, the nuclear power plant, and then there was, of course, Chernob Chernobyl, if I may say so, in Russia. So we, we had quite a couple of events in those years here, as you can see here, more in towards the 80s, um, where people started to realize that technology also has a downside. Like, uh, like a knife if you want. You can, you can save somebody's life as a surgeon, but you can also kill somebody easily. Welcome, come in and find out. Cut. <laughs> With a knife, so that would be a moment to cut for example, I think. <laughs> so, but welcome anyway. Um, just like with a knife, for example, you can um, murder someone with it and you can save somebody's life as a surgeon. Um, people started to realize that, that's why we're moving then towards an age of acceptance. Science, technology and the field of innovation, it was all about creating acceptance for change, for technologically driven change. Pish, push, <laughs> not pish, uh, but push, public understanding of science and humanities was um, the phase which is probably most common to all of you. We even have a scientific journal, which is called Public Understanding of Science, which um, also stems from this time. 
um, answering another deficit which was uh, postulated that people don't understand enough what's going on in science. Why there is science, why resources are spent in science, that's when uh, major investments were made. So there was a, a time when legitimization was a huge issue. Um, also you could, could speak of a trust deficit when um, science realized that people aren't putting enough naive trust in science and that the decline in trust in science was perceived to be a problem. The question is, since we move through these phases um, and since public understanding of science and humanities um, uh, also has come to an end, to a closure, uh, has, has reached uh, its limits, has uh, exhausted its, its, um, uh, its, its probabilities, um, the question is which area we're moving in. As always in history, in, in, in historical sciences, you unfortunately always know afterwards how you're supposed to be calling it and of course that is the, the difficulty of defining something now which is still in progress. But um, one idea could be participation. That's certainly a big part of it since this is the mantra, the dogma, um, which for example the European Commission um, is talking about all the time. It's dialogue, it's debate, it's deliberation, it's involvement, it's engagement, it's um, involving society in the knowledge creation process. Talking about definitions, um, science communication is not like a mathematical formula where you can say this is science communication and this is it not. Um, from a scholarly point of view, it's proven to be quite helpful to also define the term quite holistically, quite wide, like an um, umbrella term fits to the weather outside. Yeah, you, you put up the umbrella and you have an umbrella which embraces the whole field of science communication, which involves the communication about science, which used to be journalism. Now, of course, that has changed. Uh, that field has changed quite dramatically as well. We have social media, for example. Is that journalism? Is it not? Um, we have the, com so the communication about science, the communication within science. There's a lot of communication going on between scientists, between disciplines, the interdisciplinary exchanges. Uh, scholarly publishing, all the journals that we have, the conference which we tend to go to, and the communication um, about science. No, sorry, about, among, and between science and its public. Got it here, yeah. Between science, institutionalized science, and its publics, its stakeholders. Because um, science in the meantime, and you can go through all the theories, like mediatization theory and, and others, um, science in the meantime is heavily engaged in all kinds of uh, discussions and communication efforts with all kinds of stakeholders, with policy makers, with NGOs, with uh, citizens, with children and um, since you're already working in the field mostly you're either in the press department of a university or you're responsible for a science festival. So all of these are different kinds of catering to different stakeholders. So <coughs> it's usually quite a good idea to define the term the concept as wide as possible in order to not leave out, let's say, journalism. It was a bit of a discussion we had in Britain when, uh, when you said science communication is not science journalism. In the meantime, you see that um, science journalism associations even publicly say that there is no science journalist as such left in Britain anymore because they all do something with institutionalized communication to make ends meet and to survive in the end of the day. So if we zoom in here a bit and look at that um, term of communication, there are three main questions I think that arise. Who are the actors? Those would be you, for example, the actors in science communication, those people who actually do it. Who are the stakeholders? And those are also very diverse. Who are the most relevant actors? So those would be you, for example. And who are the most relevant stakeholders? It could be children, or it could be universities, or it could be policymakers. And you can already guess, depending on the stakeholders and the actors, it totally depends and it totally, it's totally different what we actually understand uh, when we talk about science communication. The objectives change as well. Why are we actually doing it? Is it about increasing uh, literacy? Is it about evidence-based policy making? Do we want policy makers to come to an evidence-based um, decision? And the third one would be, if, thou, if those two are answered, if we know who acts, who's the stakeholder, and why we're actually doing it, then we can define all kinds of formats. And we're going to zoom into that as well, you can guess what kind of formats we can do, because that's also a very wide spectrum. Can I make maybe a, a very short experiment? Just anyone who, who dares to, to answer me, um, 
who's, who's outspoken, um, extroverted, who, who wants to be the experiment tonight? Like, yeah, who comes late, right? Um, you're doing what in science communication? Um, I'm doing external PR in Gazprom mm -hmm. <laughs> For Gazprom, yeah. Uh, um, science center. A science center yes. um, run by Gazprom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gazprom, I think, is worldwide known, I presume, yeah. Why are you doing it? You like to do PR. Um, why do you like PR? Because um, it's a way to communicate with new people and do something interesting. Mm -hmm. Why do you communicate with people to do something interesting? <laughs> you understand uh, the game? It's kind of weird to do interesting stuff you know, by yourself. I don't know, or maybe not. <laughs> uh, because I like to do some... Two. Yeah, have we already reached um, the level to, I don't know? Yeah? No? Uh, no? I'm, I'm still thinking. Okay. Uh, why, uh, what was the question? Um, well, I mean, that's, it's in the end, we don't have to play to the, to the yeah. nines. That's the idea. You can ask that yourselves, uh, all of you, if you keep asking the same question over and over and over and over again, you come at some stage to a point where you can't answer it anymore. Where we do, there is no answer anymore. And that is when, when you're in the deepest of yourself, when you actually know why you've, an answered, uh, why you've entered this field. So this is your personal motivation why you either have already decided or want to decide or might want to decide to do that. So there's a, there's a kind of a personal conviction and that is even another layer, if you want, beneath those. If you think about all of that, this is much more complex and, and much, more, much more wider picture than just looking at that. Because that, just as a random list, of activities. Um, you can do press conferences, that would be a classical PR instrument. You can prepare a trade fair, you can run a science festival, you can organize a science slam. But those were just five examples of probably 500 we, we could come up with in the meantime of potential formats in that field. And that's essentially the reason why you need professional training when you do that. You can't just be, um, let's say, nowadays, if you're a journalist, you're good at writing a text, you might be good at producing a video, cutting a video, post-producing something. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're um, an expert in event management. It doesn't necessarily mean that you ha know about humor and how to involve things like a, like a science slam. So the whole spectrum has become so wide that it's a very professional field where you need special training. And I know you, I think you have about four weeks here in that course, which is of course a challenge to do all of that in four weeks. For example, our program I think is about 3,000 hours. It's a bit more than, than the time you've got here. Okay, but just that as an idea to show it's a very wide spectrum. Talking about international dimensions, um, I think it said, science, co science, said uh, science communication in Europe which is a contradiction in itself, if you want, because Europe as such as one unique, homogeneous um, model doesn't exist. Europe in itself is probably more diverse in the way its, uh, its countries and its cultures approach the issue of science and society than, let's say, um, China and America or South Africa and Russia. There's so much diversity and let's, let me just give you four examples of why that's the case. This is Eurobarometer um, data which you've probably seen once or twice in the last few days already. Quite um, profound, a large study which has been conducted over and over and over again over the last few years. It's very, very statistically, from a st statistical point of view, very solid, uh, very good data. The question here was, I would like to read out some statements that people have made about science, technology and environment. For each statement, please tell me how much you agree or disagree. And the question and the option was, we depend too much on science and not enough on faith. So it's the age-old religion question. For many people, religion and science contradict each other, which if you think about it, and if you go deep into it, is actually not the case. There's no reason why you can't be a strong believer in God as a scientist, and there's no reason why you can't believe in, in the possibilities and in the power of science as a priest, for example. Both exist and both is possible, but as we can see in America, where now 
Um, in so many schools, even the evolution theory isn't, thought, isn't taught anymore due to, to, to religious reasons. Um, that question, of course, is one which needs to be asked. The thing is, colored here, as you can see, there are countries where that question is answered by a clear majority with no. Like here, for example, in Britain, in Northern Europe, in Western and Central Europe. But you can also see that you have countries like Turkey here, which is down the line somewhere here, up here, Cyprus, Bulgaria, it's not Turkey, isn't it? Well, but you get the idea, yeah? I think Turkey is missing on that list. Anyway, um, so you have countries where that is about 70% and you have other countries where it's 25 Is that the same continent, really? Is that the same cultural sphere? You can see how much diversity is in that and you can do these questions through the whole spectrum. You will never get a European answer. That is, by the way, why why we um, take what we call, from a methodological point of view, a comparative approach. We don't look at the German media system and we don't look at the British media system, like they do in Britain or in Germany, but we actually compare them. We look at the Russian, the Chinese, the American, the South African, the German and the Danish media system, for example, and compare them. The political systems are just as different. The science systems are just as different. And the awareness of that diversity is I would say essential nowadays to actually know what you're doing in your field because you have to respond, you have to answer to the system where you're actually working in at the moment. And that is not necessarily Russia. Even if you work for, for a big university or Gazprom is an international um, conglomerate in the meantime, probably active in 120 different countries all over the world. So why would you only be, be interested in how certain subjects are treated in Russia? The discussion we're having at the moment about the oil pipeline uh, which goes from, uh, from Canada to th throughout through to America has probably nothing to do with Gazprom, but since it is about oil and it is about um, uh, fossil resources, they are, I suppose, are very much interested in the discussion which is going on in America at the moment. So being aware of all these different aspects in the different countries is extremely important. Another example, what kind of level uh, what is the level of involvement citizens should have when it comes to decisions made about science and technology? So there are decisions which affect uh, the regulation of telephone networks, for example, or the regulation of the internet, or stem cell research, or whether there should be pre-implantation diagnostics, like you diagnose a baby before it's born. And so all of these things are they require a regulation, a political regulation, a political process of determining whether a society wants to have that and wants to do that or not. Well, should we have public dialogue in that? Should the society be involved in that decision-making process? Like, you know, in Switzerland, they have votes for everything. Every few weeks, they vote for something. Um, that is a very extreme uh, form of a basic um, democracy. And you have other countries where people have never been asked and um, it's just taken for granted that the policy policymakers just make their decisions on their own. But you can still see already in Europe, you have countries where the people themselves say, no, uh, do you know what, that's fine. You know, there are experts for that. There are politicians we've elected. I've got nothing to do with it. I've got no idea. I don't have the education. I don't have an opinion. Uh, I don't want to be involved. I'm not interested or whatever the reasons might be. The answer is, no, I don't want to be engaged. Like countries here where you can see like 43%, 44%, there are also countries like 72%. Denmark, for example, where the consensus conference have been born. A country where, which prides itself of its uh, deliberative formats and its deliberative democracy. If you're in a country where three quarters of the people uniquely say they want to be involved in a political decision about science and technology, Good luck with one-way street um, PR and marketing efforts. If you work in a country or for a country or for a market where there's a minority of that opinion, it would be an entirely different strategy and different strategies would work in different countries and different systems. Again, I think the message here is not to understand how Europe works, but to understand that understanding the diversity is the key to actually develop the appropriate strategy for the appropriate market for the appropriate task. Another example. Um, this is from the MACES project. Uh, MACES we took as an abbreviation, you probably know it. Oh God, what was it? Measuring, um, anyway, it's about measuring science and society activities and debates in Europe. Um, 
debates on the place of science in society and this is here the number of countries. So the European countries were queried and in 25 of probably 28 countries of the time, uh, or it might, might have also been just 25 because the study is about three years old, I think it is, um, there was a debate on, an, on the environment, there was a debate on climate change issues. There's hardly any country in Europe where that was not debated. Okay, so we, we could argue we actually have um, a congruent picture of science and society issues in Europe. We're all discussing more or less the same issues. Hmm. But how can it be then that issues like science and religion were prominent in three countries of those 24 or 25 or 28? Even health and safety issues only in 11 countries and one out of three. That means you go from country to country and you have totally different public debates <coughs> about science and technology. Again, message here being it's the diversity which counts. Um, what about the research? I mean, what, what we do, scholars like me who look into how does a science and society, this, this interface work, how do journalists um, uh, respond to scientists, how do scientists respond to journalists, what about social media, how does that develop, how do policymakers incorporate scientific knowledge in their expertise, all of these things are investigated by scholars. As you can see here, there's governance of science, who rules about the science, who decides about the framework, about the circumstances, about the funding schemes and so on. Um, there's the public understanding, then of course things like informal science education, how do you treat that, but also things like history and, and sociology of science. As you can see again, this is the number of countries here. There are countries, is it? Good question. No, it's not. Um, it's, I think that is, um, the legend is missing. Um, Probably it is, it, is a, it is a number of um, major publications. I would have to look it up myself. But as you can see, there's not a clear picture that they're all doing the same thing. It's the same message again. Different people, different countries, different systems looking into different issues. Even though you would assume that we're all working in the same world and it's the same century, it's the same year as such. So the message here, diversity in Europe. Um, if you look at media studies, you usually in most countries would investigate, like in Britain, you would investigate the British media system. And so you would do in Russia the Russian media system and, and the fact that you, of course, have a totally different legacy and history of freedom of speech in this country than you have, for example, in Switzerland or in Denmark. Um, there's a, an approach by Halina Mancini who have tried at some stage to cluster and to categorize the different media systems. Um, you can argue that this categorization um, doesn't make too much sense because it's arbitrary. You can put just things in different drawers and different boxes. But from my experience, when I try to explain to students, okay guys, we're going to talk about um, 40 different media systems in this semester. You can already see how they get busy, you know. After the 20th media system or after the 10th media system, they cannot differentiate anymore. Oh, was it now Slovenia or was it Slovakia or was it Bulgar Bulgaria or Hungary or... Yeah, you get the idea. Um, that's why I think it helps to put certain countries into certain clusters, even though it becomes a bit rough then. Yeah. They have differentiated three and then later four categories. They called it the liberal model, the democratic cooperatist model and polarized plural polarized pluralist oh God, model. And then the post-communist, where you can imagine those are the countries like you have it here, the Ukraine, Poland, Czech Republic, that must be Bulgaria. Um, here you have the UK and Ireland, Germany and uh, several countries in Indonesia, Italy and France. Very different and very important to understand that you have countries like France where politics gets heavily involved, where you have subsidies, where you have radio stations that play a French song, then afterwards comes an English song because they have fulfilled a quota. They can't just play English songs all the day, all, all day long. They're just not allowed to. There are countries um, like, like Denmark where science journalism is state-funded and subsidized, heavily subsidized. So whatever happens to the media industry doesn't matter that much because there's always someone, in that case the state, which makes sure that the system keeps going. You have other countries like Austria where you actually pay cash for getting your article published in Der Standard or in, in, uh, in magazines and newspapers. So that's the spectrum again. We don't talk about journalism as such or we don't talk about media in Europe as such. It is a very multicolored picture, unfortunately. 
You can, by the way, afterwards, of course, zoom through this presentation and you can look at all of these things in detail if you can't help yourself and have nothing better to do. Let's have a quick global outlook. Um, this is actually very fresh data. I just put this in this morning because it came out like today. Um, so we're, we're as up to date as possible here. This is the UNESCO World Science Report um, called Towards 2030. And what they've looked at were the world shares of GDP and then the, the GERD, the G-E-R-D, this, this is the Investment and Research and Development. Uh, researchers and scientific publications in the G20 in 2009 and 2013. You always have these similar shades of colors. This is 2009 and 2013. Dark green would be 2009, um, light green 2013 and so on. As you can see, there are regions in the world where there's a lot of scientific activity, where there are loads of researchers, and there are other countries or other, other regions, look at South Africa here, or Africa in general, um, where of course it's a minority. So it's not an equal map. Uh, if we, if you, if you, uh, you can see really heavyweights and really lightweight champions. Let's zoom in um, into comparing the Russian Federation which they still call like that, yeah, the, um, uh, compared to the European Union, for example. Um, the red and the gray should be the researchers here. Laser doesn't work on the TFTs, it seems. Um, uh, that was 2009 and 2013, and that's the percentage of researchers working in Russia compared to the world as such, which means that 5% of researchers on this planet work in the Russian Federation. That's one out of 20, 18, something like that, 5.7. But it's more than one out of five in Europe, for example. So you can already see the differences. Um, why is this important? You're not working in a void. You're not selling washing powder. You're not um, involved in popularizing any subject. Uh, you're, you're just not communicators, you're science communicators, or you're, you're want to become professional science communicators, or you already are, depends on, on which stage of your career you're in. If that's the case, then you have to know how science works, how the system works, and how the system works internationally, that it is not eye level as such. Let me give you another example here. Um, this is what they call the outbound mobility ratio among doctoral students, the ratio between people going out to study and to learn and to come in. Ideally, that should, of course, be more or less the same. Like you have import-export ratios as well in economy, for example. Now, if loads of people come into your country who want to study in your country, and hardly anyone goes out, then you have a very low mobility of students. So it's, um, that would be a sign of a not very international um, sphere. So even without looking at, at the labels first, it's clear what you can see. Because blue, again, is, the, is the year 2000. Orange is the year 2013. So what, whatever you, before you read it in detail, you can see in sub-Saharan Africa, the little puppet, it's getting much smaller. And then we have Central Asia, where it's getting enormously bigger, like here. 3.7 to 7.6. That is the most remarkable development in the last decade when it comes to internationalization of education. What does that mean? that now in the meantime, almost eight times as many people from Central Asia, and I think that is mostly Russia and the countries around it, eight times, no, is it not? Central Asia, would, would you define it differently? <laughs> More or less, isn't it? Or not India, that would be Southeast Asia. Anyway, and not Japan either. But you get eight times as many people going out to get their education than are coming in, which means students are leaving the country in hordes. So if, if we might have a refugee crisis at the moment in Europe, but you have an education crisis in this country. This is the, the most significant brain drain in the history of science, what's happening here at the moment. People are leaving the country in hordes. Um, you could say, well, that's, that's good for mobility. Students have become very mobile and very internationally interested, but it might also be a reason that then maybe things aren't offered as much in this country in an, on an international scale, international programs as they might or should be. But that's all speculation. 
Anyway, so that's the situation, just so that you have a bit of a global picture. Let's get a um, bit more deeper into science communication. We have about more than half an hour left, a bit, almost half an hour left. Um, I would try to ask five questions now to get a bit deeper into the topic, also to show you that it's not just about press releases, about writing articles and producing videos. The field is very diverse and in order to understand that a bit better, I would ask why we're actually doing it, why you're doing it, how you're doing it and how the field is, is changing, how we're doing it in the future maybe, who's doing it, who's supposed to be doing it, where we're doing it, on which platforms and whether we can maybe learn from other players. We've already just had an example that's the industry is also coming in because there, there's a lot of innovation happening in the industry. The vast majority of biotechnological research in the meantime, for example, is financed by industry and not by public sector and by the state. Yeah, shall we go quickly through um, those few? I've mentioned it before, science literacy is always, um, uh, I think, always, is always mentioned in these, uh, these talks. Literacy is clear. You're literate as a child when you can read, write, and I think math in the meantime counts as well. So you have to be able to do your sums. Three times two is five, no, maybe six. Um, so if you can read, write, and calculate, you would be literate. This is not what's meant here. Scientifically literate would be, any ideas? What, do you feel scientifically literate? Yes, because you know what You know the fields of science. Um, yeah, it's it's more specifically really knowledge. So what do you know about science, which makes you scientifically literate? <coughs> do you know how um, the molecular structure of a certain protein, for example, looks like? Only if you studied some biochemical subject, for example. The question here is, um, in order to define literacy, what does a government, what does a society expect its citizens to know about science? At least the basic things. Should they know that the Earth circles the Sun and not the Sun the Earth? For example, is that an important thing to know? Well, yeah, because every four-year-old child should be knowing this, things like that. Um, should it be important to know that uh, a tomato, which is not genetically modified, still contains genes? Or would it be okay if someone says, um, I don't like genes in tomatoes? You know, no, get, get rid of that, those genes, you know, don't. Um, you get the idea, yeah? So how, so how much do people actually need to know about science? The thing is, uh, I showed this, this graph in Sweden a while ago, and then I had a very relaxed um, audience, because the Swedes, of course, are very impressed and, and, and proud that they are so far about, uh, above the United States. This is, by the way, the European average. EU 27 means that's the European average, so you can imagine that there are loads of others um, below, Germany here, and so on. Everyone who's had some kind of a statistics course is already wondering, where is the scale? What is 100% here? Yeah, and that's, of course, a joke. That the problem is that these questions, which we've just asked, does the Earth circle the Sun or the Sun circle the Earth? Questions like these cannot be answered on an average by much more than one out of eight people in our societies. So whatever we've done in the last 50 years in science communication um, can't be that successful, right? I mean, otherwise questions like these would not be necessary to ask anymore. Something is happening, has been happening, something hasn't working, something needs to change says here, how satisfied can we really be with the elitist state of science communication after 50 years, 15 <laughs> years of public understanding? Elitist because if you compare the communication of science to the communication of culture, political communication, um, environmental communication, business communication, cultural communication, whatever, you always reach a certain percentage of society. Science communication has always been the most elitist form of communication. You always only reach the top few percent of a society. Less than one out of ten 
persons in a society actually visits a science center, a science museum or a science exhibition at some time in their life. Nine out of ten people never go to a science center, never go to a science museum. So how is that a challenge? Yeah, I think it is. One of the hot topics in recent years, what we call then social inclusion, how do we include all of those? And we talk about the vast, vast majority, not about minorities. We talk about almost everyone in the end. How do we include those people? Instead of putting a science center somewhere and spending millions to, to fund the science center and to try to bring people in which don't come, why don't we bring the science to the people? Why don't we bring it to the shopping center, for example, and have a pop-up science shop, for example, in the middle of somewhere? So approaches like these have been more successful in recent years than the show-off exhibitions and um, very polished science promotion activities. Let's have a look at the how. Okay, we have articles, press releases, trade fairs, exhibitions, science centers. We've already had those. Those are the obvious ones. I want to tell you a short story about someone who shows that things are changing. This is um, Timothy Gowers, professor for mathematics in Cambridge. And as you can see, I think he's already got gray hair. The, um, I think you're at the high tide of your creative powers as a mathematician in your mid-twenties. So at some stage, my colleague Timothy had the impression that whatever he's been working on for the last maybe 10 or 15 years, which was the polymath theorem, any mathematicians here in the, in the room? Oops, okay, so you can correct me whatever it is that I'm saying because I have no really idea. Do you know the polymath theorem or no? Yes? Anyway, um, I think it's more important to understand um, what the overall story is all about. He didn't solve it. He didn't get it, get it solved. He didn't get it um, derived or whatever you do with an equation in the end. Um, so he started a blog. And he called for the global community and said, listen guys, I don't get this solved. I don't want to die um, at some stage and leave this as a legacy behind me. Does maybe anyone have an idea of how we can do this? And it took a couple of weeks, two, three, four weeks, and suddenly they had the solution. Everyone in the end. Nice story, you might think, um, but does it still, does it change the knowledge creation process? Well, um, this is Google Scholar, which almost everyone, I suppose, of you has seen, a search engine for scholarly publications, for scientific publications. Usually it says here, for example, it would say um, Malkov, Dimitri. Yeah, so it would be Dimitri's pu um, publication. It says here DHJ Polymath. That cannot be a name, right? So what's happening is that those people who solve the problem in that blog community now publish in the most prestigious mathematical scientific journals under a pseudonym collectively without mentioning who in the end was the person to solve that. And luckily, this is not just a single example, so you actually find many examples in the meantime where um, you have a certain crowdsourcing um, effort going on. Just as an example of if we talk about how science communication works, we have to take a step back and realize it's not just about conveying knowledge from A to B, it's not about explaining science to everyone, just the knowledge creation process, as it says here, itself is changing. The way knowledge is being created is changing and mainly driven, of course, that's your generation, by interactive media, by the digitalization, by the internet. This is the enabling technology which puts us into the position of actually having something like, some like a cultural change in science. Let's have a look at the who, because you would think if you ask people, if you ask society, um, who should be in charge of science communication? I mean, it's you in the end, yeah? Um, who should inform the citizens about the impact of science and technology? You would assume that it's the journalist. As you can see here, and those numbers have been decreasing from about 30% a couple of years ago now to 20%. Only one out of five people in Europe says, I want to hear that story from a journalist because the journalist is the person I trust. The journalist is the person I, I see the most equipped for explaining the impact of whatever science and technology has on society. It's not the industry, it's not the military for sure. <laughs> it's not the government. It's the practitioners. It's the people who actually are in the lab, who actually do the science. 
Even here, you have those here in, um, in the industry. So those would be the, uh, of course, I suppose Gazprom also does its, uh, has its research laboratories, but they're industrial researchers, so they, they don't score as high as those. So those are the people who count for people, for, for, for everyone. Well, that, of course, raises the question as to, um, do they do that? Are they really the ambassadors of science in society? Are they able to do it? Do they have the skills to do it? Do they have the motivation to do it? Do they have the mandate to do it? And it's, yeah, it's more of a rhetorical question. You can already guess the answer. So this is also one of the major challenges, how to enable scientists in the end to fulfill this expectation. And this is, we're talking about not just their role definition by policymakers, this is a societal expectation. Society expects its researchers, which are mostly publicly funded then, to respond and explain to them what the impact of their work on people's lives is supposed to be. Where does science communication take place? In press offices, in journals, in magazines, in newsletters? Okay, so we've got that. But again, I want to show you a few examples to, um, to demonstrate how, how, how wide the picture has become and that it's necessary um, to investigate all kinds of, of opportunities, particularly because if you think about it, if you want to stick out of the big mass, if you want to be the one black sheep among all the white sheep, or the one white sheep among all the black sheep might be more positive, you're supposed to do things differently. If you're just one university out of 500, which puts out its press releases like all the other 499 universities, well, you're not that different, aren't you? You can say, okay, but my text is particularly good and I've got the best headline of them all of the day, but it's still a press release. So being creative, being innovative, being different is where today's challenge lies, at least in those countries where um, most universities do have large science communication departments. From what I know, in, U in, in Russia, it's still in, in a development phase. We've talked about and we've discussed a lot about numbers in the last few days. Um, there's, a, there's an estimation that there are about 10,000 science communicators in Germany, for example. There's an estimation, or uh, uh, not an estimation, I actually know when I go to universities like Aarhus in Denmark or bigger universities in Germany, that there are 50, 60, 70 people working in communication and marketing. This is not the case for every university in Russia, right? So you have different landscapes and different resources available, of course. So let's um, have a closer look here, what we then call scientific citizenship. What makes a good scientific citizen? Not someone who accepts science as it is, but someone who's engaged, who's interested, who's open, who's involved. The state of California, for example, is not under the richest countries or the richest states in the world. That's the one where Arnold Schwarzenegger became governor and the, the, the state was literally almost bankrupt. On the other hand, they have uh, some, let's say, geological challenges. They are facing the risk of earthquakes um, in California quite a lot. So what they would need is an early warning system which ensures that if something happens, they can evacuate the population, they can, can, you know, they can do the, the usual measures which need to be done. An earthquake warning system costs tens of millions. The state didn't have that. So what did they do? They produced these little blue boxes here, which cost, I think, about $100 each, which in the end is a um, seismograph and a Wi-Fi module. And the seismograph links into your Wi-Fi at home. People just put it into their cellar and it links in. It doesn't work if you have one. It doesn't have work if you have 10 in the same street. But if you have suddenly have hundreds and a few thousand of these boxes spread out all over California, Within a few days, you have an early warning system which just cost a few couple of thousand dollars. Nice story, um, well solved, but the essential point here is that all those people who now have a seismograph in their cellar, I would think, have a different relation to geology, to volcanology, I think would probably be the term, right? They are not, they just don't know that that is science exists, they are part of the scientific process. They have become part of the process. You can find all kinds of examples in, in the era of uh, citizen science where um, we, we produce, science produces thousands of images every day of galaxies, for example. 
Um, and you would think it's easy to say whether a spiral galaxy turns right or whether it turns left. And again, I'm an information scientist, I don't really have to know much about galaxies or about astronomy. You might think that it's easy, but it's not easy for a computer. The automated analysis of such pictures is actually quite, uh, quite crap. Um, the, the image detection has improved in the past few years, but it's not capable to profoundly and correctly and accurately identify and analyze scientific data, which is pouring out of those machines and those, those uh, telescopes which we put up to the sky. So Galaxy Zoo, for example, uh, or Solar Stormwatch and other platforms ask everyone in the end, why don't you um, download this zip file and categorize those 500 pictures? And you decide whether it is a spiral galaxy turning right or whether it's one which turns left. Well, um, you might argue there's not much fun in doing that in an afternoon, but the thing is that there are thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people who are willing to engage because they think this is also their role. This is where they can help. They're interested in it. And once you've done that, you of course have a different understanding of how galaxies and how astronomy works. Um, there are all kinds of degrees of um, citizen science, uh, also much deeper involvement, definitely. But these are not all the examples. The United Nations um, have tried for a long time to um, broaden the understanding of people when it comes to epidemiological issues. How does a disease spread? Uh, why do we need vaccines, for example? These are issues which every enlightened citizen, every scientific citizen, sh citizen should know something about, whatever the person then in the end decides. But a certain knowledge should be there. As I said before, we have not been particularly successful in telling that to everyone in the end. So there's one uh, great example, no, which is unfortunately not here, but you can see it here. Um, that's Pandemic, I think in the third edition, uh, an online game, Pandemic 3, where you can decide whether you contaminate the Earth with parasites, bacteria or viruses, and um, then the virus is spread and you can infect other countries, and it's, uh, it's uh, pretty cool, pretty fun. But then, of course, you also learn what happens if I put out vaccinations? What happens if I build a school and if I raise the level of education? What happens if I, if I embrace all kinds of measures to counteract those um, epidemiological um, activities, developments? So what people learn when they play that game is actually how science works, how epidemi epidemiology works. Another example would be folded down here at the bottom where you um, can actually fold proteins. Well, um, I don't know about your hobbies. I've got a 17-year-old son, I suppose, when I go home and I would suggest, you know what, Dylan is his name, um, you know what we're going to do this, this afternoon? I've got a great idea what we're going to do this afternoon. We're going to fold a few proteins. Mm-hmm. Okay. Have a nice day, yeah, bye, I've got something better to do. So how cool is that? Um, well, as a matter of fact, there are about two million, particularly young people, who do exactly that, who fold proteins. This is their game, because it's cool. It's graphically well done, you learn a lot about it, about biology. Again, you could argue, this is just edutainment. It's fun, it's, um, yeah. Is it serious? Is there really some real scientific output of it? Um, is it serious? Well, this is from Nature, which is not our least important um, scientific journal, put it like that. Nature, Structural and Molecular Biology. Um, again, not a, not a biologist either, but um, what is apparently about is the decoding of the HI virus in primates. What has, had happened here was that in that game, they found um, the structure of a protein which biotechnological research had been looking for for two decades and didn't find it. The players found it by coincidence because that's the idea of the game. Now this is the journal publication and you have here Firas Katip and Franco Di Maio, um, some scientists from somewhere, but then you have Folded Contenders Group and the Folded Void Crushers Group. These are game clans for those who play World of Warcraft or other games. These are the clans of those, those two clans which have in the end competed and have solved 
that problem and have found out um, about the protein in the end. So a computer game solving a riddle in H HIV and in AIDS vaccines, more significantly than tens of thousands of researchers in all kinds of laboratories all across the world have done. So again, the question, how could public engagement possibly be more authentic? Authenticity of what it is that we're doing, not just conveying what it is that we're doing, not just legi legitimizing what it is that we're doing, not just trying to, um, to prove that spending public resources is a good thing, is a necessary thing, but these examples show that communication itself can change the face of knowledge creation and of innovation back. So kind of the, it's turned on its head, the model. Let's have another look at the what. And I think we have to have to slowly come to an end, I suppose. <laughs> um, what can we learn from others? Hmm. We have already, uh, again, have had one industrial example, and, and the good thing is that uh, those examples become more. There are more and more communicators who actually work for um, enterprises, who work in high technology, in innovation, in science. Uh, Greenpeace, for example. Greenpeace used to publish their annual report. Um, it says here, carting away the oceans on sustainable fisheries. What makes fishing sustainable? How do we preserve the oceans? So they produce this report every year. So how cool is that, a report? Well, who orders a brochure? Only those people who are really interested. What they produced then was a little um, handy game, a little um, smartphone game called Shark versus Mermaid Death Squad, where in the end you have little sharks and you have the mermaid and you, you hunt her down and um, it, it's of course, like it's Pac-Man of course, yeah, it's a, it's, it, it's, it's a funny game. And in between the hosts have those little slices of information about fisheries, about the oceans. Yeah. You combine the fun factor with the information. Tens of thousands of people have downloaded the game. I suppose, and there are of course no, no figures, there's no proper evaluation as, as so often in our field, but uh, I would assume that only a fragment of those people who are willing to play that game have ever come up with the idea of reading a Greenpeace report in print or online as a PDF or whatever. Another example. PETA is an organization which fights animal experiments and fights for animal rights, as you might know. It can be quite extreme sometimes. They're the ones who spray color on people's fur coats, which are still kind of um, popular in, in Russia, aren't they? Yeah, because it's kind of cold here. I, I, I thought about bringing my shapka, actually, which I brought um, 20 years ago, whatever it was, when I was in Moscow. Probably smells in the meantime quite heavily, but um, you still have those fur coats if you had a, an active PETA movement in this country. It, um, um, it would probably, you would have that discussion as well. You probably don't, I don't know. But what they did, they produced also an online game called um, Cage Fight, where you as, um, um, as the player, you go through a, um, a biotechnological laboratory and you free little cats and monkeys and um, mouse, uh, mice, uh, for example, but you also kill the researchers. You shoot them, you kick them, you stab them. Yeah? They defend, of course, at some stage, so there are knife fights between the researchers and you as the one saving the animals, right? You're laughing, it is funny, but again, if we think twice, of course, how funny is it to encourage people to shoot a scientist? Hmm. So uh, what's the ethical issue involved here? Is that how we're supposed to be doing it? The thing is, of, of course, the story goes again, tens of thousands of young people downloading this game, finding it funny, and little slices in between, you can't really see it here in the screenshot, um, little slices of information being thrown in and explaining to people why this is a relevant issue, that uh, animals are tortured and that animal experiments don't need to be. If you speak to, um, to biomedical researchers, biochemical uh, researchers. Um, they can tell you one story after the other why without having animal experiments, they, we wouldn't have the progress, we wouldn't have the medication we would, we would have today. There needs to be a discussion in society about where we need those experiments and where we don't. But the NGOs in that case, with the two examples of Greenpeace and PETA, are enormously successful, had have understood so well what a social media campaign is. I could, I could show you all these examples of the recent um, 
uh, Greenpeace campaign against Shell, for example, with Lego, uh, where they, um, anyway, it would be, would be, would go into much detail now, but there are so many examples where they have been tremendously su successful because they've understood that it's in today's media environment about making news viral, um, spreading the message, enabling people to share things, right? Making them um, the advocates of your own issue. And what do we do? We put out a press release. We call for a press conference. We organize a trade fair or an exhibition. Is this the answer to that? The question, of course, then is, to which extent should science as an institution be allowed and encouraged to go that far? Should we really start developing computer games? <laughs> maybe not. But it also is an encouragement of being maybe more creative, more innovative, and thinking about more of a wider spectrum of what communication nowadays means in a time when we lose the newspapers and when we lose the classical channels and when your generation doesn't read uh, print newspapers uh, anywhere in the first place. So how can academia adapt its outreach to the new media environment would be the question here. Okay, so that would be my tour de force, so to speak. And my idea of a, well, one minute left. That was, the, the, the timing is everything, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Mere coincidence. Um, so, but I think we have some time now left, hopefully, and probably to have a bit of a discussion and some questions maybe, or uh, maybe not. <laughs> yeah? In case, in case you have any. Well, he has, he has of course, got a good question. Uh, why did Europe get rid of, uh, get rid of uh, scientific literacy studies? Because, and why do you think we're still continuing them? Because it's not that in Europe they were useful at that time and now they're not useful, it's just because you got arrived at, at the conclusion that they're wrong, those studies. Um, well, the we just do the same thing right now. Um, they tell you a lot about um, what people know about science. Our challenge is um, that people don't make evidence-based decisions. We had the discussion, discussion yesterday, and I'm answering your question in a minute, so don't worry. Um, we had the discussion yesterday, um, if a mother has to decide whether she's going to vaccinate her child against measles. Sounds like an easy to answer question. The thing is that children are dying, and this has become an ep ep epidemic in the world and thousands of children are dying in America at the moment because mothers or parents refuse, not just the mothers, the parents refuse um, to vaccinate their children. So in that case I have a very strong opinion and I mean every uh, medical doctor would, would agree that vaccinations are a great achievement in medical development, in, in, in science and innovation. If we want to enable the mother to make the right decision, she can make the decision not to do that, but she should be able to make that decision on the basis of having the right information. If she decides that she's not going to do it because out of, I don't know, ethical standards or her norms or her values or rel religious beliefs, for example, um, there's no way why a scientist should and could uh, disagree and say, no, I'm, I'm forcing you to do that. But what shouldn't happen is that parents refer to studies which have been retracted 10 years ago, which have been wrong in the first place, which have been distorting the whole field in any way. So there's so much disinformation out there about um, how vaccines apparently don't work. And those are what people refer to over and over again, right? So what uh, we have to take one step back and, and see, we want society to be able to make valid and good and responsible decisions. For that they need information. And you sh could kind of short circuit the whole thing and say, okay, then we just need to, to make sure that they all know enough literacy in order to have them all accept science, embrace science, behave as a scientific citizen. Unfortunately, all studies that we've done, um, that have been done, in the past decades have unfortunately uniquely shown that an increase in knowledge is not positively connotated and, and, and correlated um, to an increase in acceptance. If you know more, you don't necessarily accept things more. If you know something better, if you understand something better, you're not necessarily more positive about the subject. It's actually the opposite. If knowledge increases, you usually get a split between those who are always skeptical and who then say with more knowledge, I've always known it, you know, now, never again. 
And you've got those who are always rather positive and with more information, they become the advocates and they become dogmatic and they go through the cocktail parties and try to convince everyone that vaccinations are the most important thing, otherwise uh, the world's going to end. Um, so information itself actually splits society. That's why looking at the literacy level alone doesn't really help us. Because even if we understand um, how low literacy levels are, even if we were able to increase the scientific literacy, we would not answer the societal challenges which we have. We would not be able to answer the fact that science as it happens in this building, in this university, in your institutions, the research that's going on in your institutions, that this science, this research should actually respond to the grand challenges of society. Grand challenges are what? Climate change, the overaging population, um, health issues, health education, so the big questions which everyone in the end is asking himself or herself, which are determining how we work, how we live, um, how we play, how, how we live our lives, right? Those are the big questions. Is science responding to that? Are they answering our questions? Are they solving our problems for the future? Some do and some probably don't. And again, we're back at this public engagement question. To which extent should um, society at large, civil society, be involved, be required, be entitled to be part of that decision-making process if it comes to a regulatory decision, for example? And that is unfortunately not just a knowledge question. This is not a literacy question. Um, I would be so happy if it was. Um, it would be so easy. Right? then we just need more flyers and more brochures and more TV, popular science TV programs and everything would be fine. Um, the thing is, if we have more information and we actually split society, then um, that can't possibly be the answer. And that decline, just one more sentence as an answer, a long answer to a short question, I know, if the decline in trust, and we've seen that in, in every culture, in every system in the past few, let's say 10, 15 years in particular, the naive trust in science, this question about science can solve our problems, science is, uh, determines how we live in the future, they have the answers, they have the monopoly of truth. The answer to that question um, has significantly, significantly gone, gone down in, in the past few years, and really much so. Less and less people are embracing science as something that really solves all of their problems. If you look at science policy makers, they see that as the largest problem in history. You know, this is our challenge. We need to convince everyone that science is cool, that it's important, that it is relevant, that we all need to do it, more people need to study it. Scholars like us who, who investigate the field actually come to exactly the opposite conclusion. We think that a critical public, and I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm able to say that in Russia. I was recently in China and I was very careful when I said that because um, you know, enabling people to be critical is not very popular sometimes there. But um, a critical public, a society which is able to reflect what's going on in science, to have its own ideas about how, f how futures are supposed to look like, how technologies are supposed to be used, which energy we're supposed to be using, um, and all of these questions which arise, if society is able to reflect and criticize that, isn't that maybe the greatest asset in the history of communication, really? Isn't that something, isn't that a real achievement? So isn't the, the, the lack of trust and the declining trust maybe actually quite a good sign that society is growing up? Uh, again, just a thesis, there's no real answer to that. Um, but you see, it's not just one-dimensional. There's always several sides to the issue. But sorry, that was a very long answer. Should we take another uh, question? Well, unfortunately, we have to stop here. But <laughs> okay. You'll stay here, right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Just, uh, uh, well, the thing is that we have another speaker right mm -hmm. now ready because everything moved a little bit. So if you stay here, you just can talk yep. to people. I'm here. Early, that would be better. Uh, so thanks again, Alexander. Thanks for coming. I think that was very enlightening and uh, profound. Uh, let's just uh, thank him with the... <laughs>